I'm going to make my remarks in two seconds, but I just want to say we are now 15 minutes late, and I say that only because I do not want to take any time away from the end of our day. So I want to ask everyone, including the community listeners, to make sure that we try to stay on time as much as we can, because people have flights, etc., and so forth, okay? So if I act kind of bossy during the day, just forgive me. My dear colleagues and friends, I'm writing this epistle to you about an unusual gathering that is about to occur at a major university in the New World. It will explore the life of an extraordinary person who has, up until now, been largely forgotten by history. Her name is Sarah Levy, the fifth daughter of a well-known elite Jewish family, the Itziks, who made their home in Berlin, a court city of the Prussian Empire, in the second half of the 18th century. I've chosen this genre, the epistle, to tell you about her world because of the significance that letter writing held for women of the aristocracy and aspiring middle classes in the 18th century. Private letters, long neglected by historians, are actually an important source of history and of women's historical experience in particular. Frequently penned as a private correspondence to a friend, the 18th century epistle often engaged the most pressing social, intellectual, philosophical, and cultural issues of the hour. We have hundreds of letters by prominent Berlin Jewish women, such as Rahel Levin Valhaven, known to many via Hannah Arendt's biography, among others. Other important women of this era who wrote letters included Fadchen Liebmann, Anne Lebel, Rechen Dorothea Mendelssohn, Lea Zalman, Henriette Heltz, Sarah von Gutas, Filipina Cohen, Mariana Meyer, and the Itzik daughters, Fanny von Anschein and Sarah Levy. Levy was born in 1761, just as the city was becoming a center of the Prussian Enlightenment. Benefiting from imperial patronage and bourgeois economic development, the arts and sciences grew among the city's cultural and intellectual elite, which included Huguenot, German Protestants, Catholics, as well as Jews. In contrast to the rest of Prussian Jewry, Berlin's Jews enjoyed imperial privileges after the Seven Years' War that allowed them to participate broadly in the stimulating env environments of the capital. As the daughter of a privileged Jewish family, Levy was active both as a consumer and producer of the cultural and artistic activities of her social class. She, with other Jewish women, became Solonière, hostesses of intimate social gatherings that fostered bonds of friendship between Jews and non-Jews, musicians, playwrights, and philosophers. In these exclusive voluntary meetings of cultural sociability, like-minded friends and acquaintances met to discuss and experience new arts and ideas. Yet heretofore, most, although not all, of the scholarly attention on the vitality of Berlin's Jews has focused on two male groups, the German-Jewish economic elite and the Muscovine, Jews from Eastern Europe who traveled to Berlin in order to pursue broader cultural and intellectual activities unavailable to them east of the Oder River. The Jewish elite strove to integrate into non-Jewish society, adopting the mores, values, and social practices of the surrounding culture. They also, however, supported the Muscovine of the institutions, including schools, printing presses, and journals, most of which were penned in Hebrew. The Haskalah of the late 18th century and much of the 19th remained a predominantly male project of Jewish modernization. Its advocates strove not only to support Jewish integration into European society, but also to transform Jewish culture and society as values unto themselves. The Muscovine championed among other changes in Jewish society, a new pedagogical attitude toward traditional Jewish texts and education that emphasized the dissemination of broad literacy in Hebrew beyond the confines of the rabbinic elite. Yet paradoxically, when Muscovine wrote and published in this nascent form of modern Hebrew, their words were generally directed to other men. Because scholarly attention focused predominantly on the written text of the intelligentsia and on the social behavior of the financial elite, the historical experience of Jewish women in this period was rendered almost invisible. The women, the wives, daughters, friends, readers, 
And as the symposium will show, listeners, performers, and patronesses in their own right among the German Jewish elite were less apparent to historians because while many elite women were indeed literate, their cultural productivity did not generally appear in published journals or manifestos. They wrote in German, not Hebrew. There were not maskilot, enlightened Jewish women with a Hebraist commitment. The elite Jewish women of Sarlevi's period and social milieu have been a subject of fascination, both by contemporaries and later scholars, but most scholarly treatments have been preoccupied with positioning the Salonier as a litmus test of Jewish continuity in the face of rapid modernization. They've either been praised as proto-feminists who successfully challenged their patriarchal conventions of traditional Jewish life, or condemned for exiting the Jewish community through extramarital affairs and conversion to Christianity in their later years. The great 19th century historians of the Jews, Einach Gretz and Shimon Dubnov, for example, held the jauntest view of the elite Jewish women of Berlin. For Gretz and Dubnov, who wrote history as part of their commitment to modern Jewish existence, the Salonier were traitors, severing their ties respectively to their religion and people. 20th century Jewish nationalist historiography concurred with their historical reading. Yet newer views of conversion, both in the medieval and early modern worlds, suggest that not all converts necessarily abandon their former faith community or kinship relationships. Modern conversion in Prussia usually occurred after acculturated behaviors, such as participating in general German artistic and literary culture, engaging in faith social gatherings, and loosening ties to traditional Jewish religious prescriptions had long been in place. Conversion, it is now suggested, was part of the spectrum of choices within Jewish modernization. It has taken creative new approaches to history to find the women who are active in Berlin's enlightened society and to evaluate their lives on their own terms and not as a litmus test of Jewish or any other presumptive commitments. It is meant honoring these women's historical agency as individuals. It is also meant looking for new kinds of sources. One productive avenue of locating them is through the genre from which I am reading, the epistle. Another promising avenue through which to locate women's historical agency is one on which this symposium is particularly focused, music. Domestic music making was part and parcel of the cultural world of elite homes in late 18th century Berlin. Jewish families, eager to partake of this culture as a means of integrating into German society, became ardent patrons and auditors of this art form. Music played a central role in the salon created by a select group of German Jewish women like Sarah Levy. It was performed, listened to, and discussed by the salonier and their guests, carefully chosen, cultured individuals who could appreciate what was being played. These salons were domestic, but not exactly private. Sarah Levy came to her musical interests through her natal family's value system. Daniel Itzik, Sarah's father, principal supplier of the Prussian Mint to the court and army, made sure that his daughters were well educated musically. He hired Johann Philipp Kielmberger, a student of an advocate for the famed Baroque composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, for Hannah and Bella, his two eldest daughters. Like her sisters, Sarah Levy studied music. She with Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, son of Sebastian Bach, and became an accomplished keyboardist. She commissioned progressive and noteworthy compositions from both Friedemann and his brother, Carl Philip Emanuel, and she owned a massive collection of music manuscripts and printed editions of music from her own day and from the previous generation. Levy played the harpsichord and forte piano, both within the context of her salon and in the public venue of the Singakademie zu Berlin, or Bourgeois Choral Society, founded in 1791 by Karl Fasch, a harpsichordist to the Prussian court. The Singakademie was later directed by Karl Friedrich Zelter, Abraham Mendelssohn's music teacher. Sara Levy became particularly active in the Singakademie after her husband Samuel Levy's death in 1806 and donated her collection of music, which included instrumental pieces, solo works, chamber music, symphonies, and keyboard concertos to Zelter. And those of you who were lucky enough to be here last night heard some of that gorgeous music played on period instruments. 
Due to Levy's commitment to preserving Germany's musical past, hundreds of Bach scores were saved from lack of interest due to change, musical trends in the 19th century, and the ravages of 20th century hatreds. My dear friends, turning its attention to this enlightened Jewish woman, this symposium raises many complex questions about this period in history. Foremost, her dedication to music as patron, collector, performer, and salon hostess has allowed the symposium's organizers to bring together scholars from diverse fields who are interested in Sarah Levy, but who have rarely spoken about her in the same place. The musicologists and musicians have tended to talk to one another, as have the intellectual historians of the Enlightenment. Historians of the Jews, too, have often found that their work, published in journals devoted to Jewish history, was rarely read by generalist scholars. The result has been that parts of Saladini's life and larger world have been studied, but her whole person, herself, that key enlightenment concept has not been truly seen. Lady's life belongs to the history of the European, German, and Jewish enlightenments. Her world stands in dialogue with the Hebraist Haskalah and its general distance from music as a means to to cultivate the regeneration of the Jews. Clarifying the distinctiveness of different paths to modernization helps to understand the intended relationship between the Enlightenment, the Haskalah, modernization, acculturation, and secularization. So too, Sarah Levy's life belongs to the fields of women and genders history and to the history of music. Examining her life also allows scholars to probe how late 18th century philosophic ideals found concrete expression in the arts among elite German Jews. Levy's passion for Bach and his legacy engages questions of musical historicism and its relationship to the processes of canonization of German and European art music in the 18th and 19th centuries. Because Jews were central to the formation of the German middle class in the 19th century and music making was key to their aspirations, chief among which was the value of Bildung, moral self-improvement through the acquisition of general European education that would lead to refinement and the development of character, it behooves scholars to take more seriously the roles of Salonier, like Sarah Levy, and of the music she performed and patronized in social class formation. Her involvement with the Singh Academy and its archive raises questions about the role Jews played in creating, protecting, and preserving the German musical heritage. By hosting leading scholars in the fields of musicology, Jewish studies, gender studies, German literary studies and history, albeit opening up all the um, events to a broad audience, which was decidedly not part of the late 18th century's conception of the public, the symposium's form echoes the world of the Salon. It recreates this multidisciplinary conversation that was central to Salon culture. Moreover, participants have heard and will be able to hear the music that's a, that was at the center of Star Lady's world, as well as experience the parodic virtuosity of Aharon Kalavolson, a Maskil, who was Levy's contemporary. The comic form of the play, Latin Sin and Fremelein, reflected the Enlightenment's satiric spirit and the Haskalah's commitment to self-critique of Ashkenazic Jewish society. None of the play's characters who represented the range of Jewish typologies of the late 18th century, such as the Arivis mercantile father, the culturally overcompensates overcompensating East European Jewish Talmud Chacham, whose intellectual bona fides are suspect, the imperious bourgeois daughter, and the well-meaning mother escaped his pen's parodic ink. The play's languages, German, Hebrew, and Yiddish, also point to the linguistic choices, each accompanied with variable meanings, available to Western Ashkenazi Jewry at the end of the 18th century. On her own terms, Sara Levy was a fascinating and unusual person whose legacy as a musician allows us to experience viscerally her world and musical passions with all of our senses. 
She was a bold cultural intellectual boundary crosser of the early modern period, who negotiated a variety of environments while maintaining her own religious identity. Levy did so while participating actively in contributing to a broader cultural context in which secularization, modernization, and interfaith sociability, issues that are still relevant today, were central if contested subjects of discussion. Immanuel Kant's iconic Enlightenment salvo was sapere aude, dare to know, the call to his fellow Europeans to possess fully their own rationality and apply it to knowing and shaping the world. In her own time, Salah Levi did not hesitate to know herself and the world around her. It is we, later generations, who have been lax in the task of knowing her. The co-organizers hope that this symposium will give Sara Levy her historical due, honoring her selfhood as a woman, a musician, a Jew, and as an enlightened person. Ah, I must put down my pen. I hear the house stirring. Perhaps I have a visitor. But I trust that you comprehend the contents of this letter, even if I close in haste. Adieu, my colleagues and friends, with affection. Thank you.